Sarah Albad, we hear from Horse Racing Nation, joined by Caitlin Free to talk about opening day at Churchill Downs for some fall racing. Nice to have racing back, super close to me, right in Louisville, close to you as well. And we were talking a little bit off air. This is going to be your first full fall at Churchill Downs. Are you excited? Yeah, I'm very excited. I had some opportunities back last fall with them, got to do a few uh, weekends with them in September as well as November, kind of as a guest handicapper, but this is going to be my first fall meet there. So super excited to be back. We got a little taste of it in August when we ran the Arlington Million uh, one day card there at Churchill, but super excited to be back. Definitely missed turf racing, but we're going to have it back here in a couple of months, God willing, but definitely excited for the fall. And I mean, Downs After Dark to start us off. We can't go wrong with that. <laughs> Definitely. And even without the turf racing, this is still a pretty intriguing card, at least from a wagering standpoint as well. And oh, yeah. I think you're faced with a big question in the first race that we're going to talk about, since we're going to go through the late pick five and race number four in Salido, big favorite for the Brad Cox barn coming in off a layoff. Are you trying to beat this horse or are you singling and moving on? What's the strategy? I definitely want to use this horse. I'm not sure I would single in the spot because there's another one that I also really, really do like. But if you are looking to single, I can see why a lot of people would single this horse. Brad is great when it comes to time off, dropping from main special weight to main claim. He's at 38% on the year for that. Uh, main claims in general, he's over 30%. So I can see why this horse would be a logical single. Uh, makes a ton of sense. He's got a great percentage of Ron Drew, not only at Churchill, but everywhere else. But there was another horse that was a little bit interesting to me. It's actually the full brother to Constitution in here for Chris Hartman. He was originally with Todd Fletcher. Had a decent debut on the sloppy track at Belmont. Has raced a couple of times, has fallen off a little bit. But it seems like maybe he could be getting back to his better self. He runs best fresh. So he's going to be back in here fresh. Hasn't ran since March. And Chris has a fantastic percentage when it comes to horses coming off of a little bit of layoff. He's at 36%. I like the way him and Francisco Arietta have a partnership together. He's got a great partnership with um, Mitchell Merle, too. But Arietta is going to get the call on this horse. This horse is 12 to 1 on the morning line. So I can see this one maybe figuring in there. If you're kind of maybe trying to be in Salido, I would say this would be the one that I would most look toward. But this could be a case where you could just single and move on. Because I'd say in Salido is the most likely winner. This could be. If you're not just playing the uh, late pick five, maybe to do an exact uh, or use this horse in some more exotic places as well. Yeah, I had a tough time getting around this horse just for multi-race purposes. The only other one that I was like, oh, this is a cool note, was the horse that you just talked about, Constitutional Law, seeing that full brother to Constitution. Obviously, that's a big pedigree note for this horse. But then you also see that he's in for the maiden 50. He's had plenty of chances. If you want to take him at 12 to 1, I can't talk anybody off of that price, especially with the favorite having some questions to answer coming in off that layoff. But to me, this is just a move that we've seen Brad Cox have success with. You know that he's got his main man riding. And there is a horse to the outside, uh, Lucky Smile, that I think is going to take some wagering attention just based on the connections and being a new face to this kind of group. But with our Horse Racing Nation first-timer report, this one does not rate very highly. This one's a three and five being the possible best. And when it's a trainer like Todd Pletcher, his horses generally get higher ratings just because he is so good with those debut runners with so many different areas of you know those statistics as well. So, so to see this one show up as a three and then also be seven to two on the morning line, this wasn't one that I had any interest in. Yeah, maybe one to definitely take a pass. I kind of have to question, you know, with the aqueduct slash Belmont meeting going on, why this horse would show up in a maiden claim at Churchill for Worth Murphier and uh, Todd Fletcher. That just kind of seems out of place to me. So I would definitely maybe give this one a wait and see type of approach, as you're saying. I'm with you on that. And speaking of Todd Fletcher and a move that's a little funky to me when you have that Belmont aqueduct, I think they're calling it BAQ back, um, which is silly but also kind of fun um mm -hmm. another curious move for them in the fifth race it's a maiden special weight for two-year-olds that are going a mile summon your courage is another todd pletcher horse going to be also ridden by tyler gaffleone and another short price on the morning line and this one is a horse that is stretching out and i think everybody's gonna see echo again in the past performances mm -hmm. and immediately be like well this horse must be the goods but a practical joke stretching out is never really a move that 
gets me excited at two to one, especially this horse has also had a turf work. I feel like they kind of don't really know what he wants to do yet. And these Todd Fletcher horses that are decent, they don't take four or five starts to break the maiden. So I have a little bit of skepticism about this horse. The one that I really liked in here was the number seven track mate. This one was second last time out to verifying, verifying who went out for the Brad Cox barn and is a half to midnight Bisu. And that was a pretty tenacious victory over this horse because track mate went out early, had the stamina already from having gone a mile on the turf course. So at least this one has tried the distance already, which I do really like, even if it was on the grass. Um, and I think just having that foundation of having gone the distance, having showed some gameness and grit last time, um, and five to two certainly makes sense for this horse. Um, and then the three as well, Frank's honor. I wanted to add to my ticket, just ran like a horse that would appreciate a little bit more ground going forwards. What did you think? I certainly agree with a lot of what you're saying. I thought Summon Your Courage was another peculiar Todd Fletcher, as you said. Definitely seems to be improving. Uh, I think he ran a lot better last time out with the blinkers against Echo again. Still was much beaten by a horse that probably has grade one expectations in his future. But he's faced some pretty tough competitions. Uh, wasn't crazy about his uh, next behind his most recent start. But the other three horses that he's been beaten by are Owens Leap. Mo Strike and Echo again. Those are all stakes caliber horses. So I think he finds a softer field today. I like that he's keeping, or excuse me, um, Thursday. I like that he's keeping the blinkers on. I think that could be the key. He way improved off that. But as you said, you see a turf work in here. He's coming down to Churchill. I don't think that they know what this horse wants to do. I think they threw the blinkers on and he did improve. So I'm not sure with this one, if it's going to take a little more time, he could automatically break the maiden. The other one that I was really looking at was track made as you say that one really improved after one start on the turf i like a little bit of extra distance for this horse especially with the breeding by a uh, union rags out of an ap and mare from a very nice female family d wing lucas has a really good crop of two-year-olds right now it's like we're seeing the 80s again almost <laughs> or something like that um there was one unraced horse um a first time starter that i wanted to maybe give a chance to has Renee Diaz, the um, apprentice rider, who's had a very, very good year, has had a fantastic year riding for Michael McCarthy. This one's Tis 2020. Uh, very good breeding from uh, the family My Sweet Addiction, Damn Healthy Addiction, was grade one caliber herself. Michael McCarthy doesn't have the best number of two-year-olds, so that may be a wait and see, but could be a bomb to maybe use in your exotics. But I was with you. There's some horses that are in the also eligibles that I definitely would want to pay attention to before I made a ticket to see if any of them go in or out because there's some really nicely bred horses in there. Wadsworth would be one that I would think maybe would be better on the turf, but had an excuse in the debut up at Saratoga. But, I mean, really track mate um, and summon your courage and Frank's honor, as you said, uh, stepping up in distance with the breeding he has for Kenny McPeak, who likes to pull rabbits out of his hat at Churchill. Um I think that pretty much has you covered in this race. I'm with you. And I think that this is a spot where people will kind of just spread because they don't really know what to do with these horses. Yeah. But this is sort of where you can narrow down, okay, who actually makes some sense in here? Are you trying to beat a favorite? Are you going with these first time starters? None of the firsters in this race rate that highly on our first timer report. The maximum that anyone has received for a ranking in here is a three. So that would be the 10 to 2020 who you mentioned the 11 princely and then the 12 Mr. Midway is a two. So the threes can certainly win, especially if the rest of the field is not um, going to be in a grade one next time out to say the least. Uh, but the twos and the ones I kind of toss right away. However, here you're getting 15 to one versus the earlier race where you're getting seven to two on a horse with the same kind of ranking. So if you want to take a shot, the price is much better. Mm -hmm. um, moving on to the sixth race. Now we have allowance optional claiming horses, and these are still two-year-old fillies. We're going seven furlongs the first time for many of them to get to stretch out. I like that this race is here so that they have the option of not going right into stakes company. There's more, uh, options for these horses that break their maiden on debut or maybe don't want to take that next step up and face really stiff competition. What do you think of these allowance races for the two-year-olds? I'm with you on that. I'm glad that they have these caliber races because almost all, I, I think almost all of them had to go immediately to a stakes next time out. And I'm not sure these are stakes quality 
type of fillies just yet, if at all. Um, honestly, the one I look to in this race, a little bit of a price. Uh, I think she can win based off how I saw she improved in the debutante at Ellis. Was still beaten by six lengths, but she saved ground. She had a little bit of a better ride than she did get um, in the debutante at Churchill. And she was up against Wonder Wheel, who we know is a grade one caliber horse, was grade one placed a couple of weeks ago. But I think Crackalackin could get back to her best self after having about a month off. Um, Sarah Hamilton is really, really proud of this horse. She's conditioned her very well, Francisco Arietta up. Again, and I do think that um, she's, staying, she's staying at the same distance. She may have just freaked on the mud at Keeneland and just really, really, really liked it. But I loved her debut. I threw out the effort in the debutante at Churchill, the debutante at Ellis, I thought was a little bit of a better effort. She, you know, as I said, she was beaten by six leagues. But I think Just a Warrior is a really, really nice filly, maybe one of the top two-year-old fillies in the country. So cutting back in class, I can maybe see her um, being worth a shot in here at the price. But Honestly, Pachuca is the other one that really made sense to me. She's coming out of a similar race. Um, she had an effort on the turf, which was really, really dull. I, I mean, being by Ghost Sapper, I mean, I can kind of see it on the turf. I can see it more with synthetic. I'm not quite sure why they do that, but she would uh, be the other one that I would maybe look to in this race. But if I'm being honest with you, uh, Shoplifter, another one with Tyler Gaffleone, I think this race is wide open. This was a race that I actually had a little bit of trouble with. Yeah, I would agree that this one is tougher than the previous race that we talked about. Um, were you there for Crackalacking's debut? Because I feel like we were both there, and then we talked to Sarah afterwards. Is that mm -hmm. what happened? Okay, yes. And she was the yeah. 11. Yes. yes. Okay. That was a very impressive debut. I don't love that she's kind of taken a step back since then, but mm -hmm. she's going to replicate what she showed in her first race. This is a great spot to do it, and it's a great price to see it as well. Mm -hmm. um, and plenty of other horses will take more of the wagering attention. Uh, Pachuca that you mentioned, uh, I like the foundation, the longer on the turf. I don't really know what that move was about. Maybe they wanted the distance or maybe they thought that she'd appreciate it. Um, but be your best to beat her in that race, I think, is Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies turf bound. Um, and to me, looks like a potential winner of that race so far from what we've seen from these two-year-old Phillies on the turf. So maybe she just didn't appreciate the surface. Um, and I don't think this field is that field whatsoever. Um, I, I looked a little bit at Team Max, the number five horse. I felt that this one might be ignored a little bit um, based on the Ellis debut and win. But I like mm -hmm. the work for this horse coming in as well. Um, I think 10 to 1 is very fair for this one. And free drop Maddie all the way to the outside in the post 11. I like that she's not completely on the outside. There's at least one horse there because I liked American Rockette a lot um, breaking from post 10. And we saw what happened with that horse a couple weeks ago or maybe a week ago. It just feels like forever ago. At Saratoga, uh, decided to just go way out into the middle of the course mm -hmm. and add an extra furlong to her race. So these babies, when they have the open space, space next to them. You don't always get the same kind of results and performance that you would if they were going in a straight line to start off. So um, I just like that this one had at least two starts under her belt, shipping in from Lone Star, um, just figures kind of fit. I don't read too much into the two-year-old figures because they can improve so much from one start to the next. Uh, but this one has already shown that is fast enough um, if nobody really jumps up in this field. So five, six, and 11 were the ones that I wanted to go with in here. The next race features two uh, horse racing enigmas in Gunnet and Hidden Scroll. Do you trust either of them? Would you include one of them? Would you include both of them? What do you think about those two? I don't trust either of them. I'm not sure... I would persuade anybody against not including them because they're obviously talented. But as you said, they're enigmas. We could have the enigma Mount Rushmore if Dennis Moment was in here. There was a race. <laughs> there was a race in the spring where um, Gunnett was in with Dennis's Moment, and of course, neither of them won. So I'm going to take the same approach here and say neither of these horses will win. There were two horses I was particularly interested in this race. Uh, one of them was being surveillance. This horse is equally as good on the dirt as he is the turf. I think this horse is pretty much in career best form was stakes place last time out. Necker Island is a horse that I think very highly of. He was third by a half a length to him at Ellis Park. Coming back to Churchill, he's got good form at Churchill. Um, hasn't won a race here, but he's 
never been worse. Uh, actually, has an eighth place here. So draw a line through that. And he's never really been worse than fourth here. So I think he could definitely hang with this group. Took him a little bit of time to break his main broken maiden on the turf, but has been really productive since then. Is stakes placed. And I mean, I just think he's in the best form of his life. And Keith DeSormo and Adam Biscuits that can sneak up on us. So I definitely want to use surveillance in this race. Um, and then another one that I really wanted to talk about is going to be the 10 major fed has had a little bit of time off. Um, was a little bit disappointing against Twilight, Twilight Blue and Mask of Parade, but Twilight Blue has really taken a step forward. Mask of Parade has as well. Those are graded stakes quality horses. And it had been a little bit of time between drinks of water for major fed. Hadn't won in about a year now at this point, but he loves Churchill Downs. Maybe shaking the rust off a little bit in his last race. Um, it had been, you know, a little while since he'd been to the Warner Circle, as I said. But coming off of a layoff now, a little bit of a concern to me, but I definitely do think he finds a way softer group in here. I think these are the type of horses with Gunnet and Hidden Scroll. You cannot trust them. So you need to look for alternatives in this race. I just think Hidden Scroll is not the same as he was on debut. One, very impressively last time out at Belterra, but... This is Belterra versus Churchill Downs and may or um, allowance type of company. So it's very, very different. And then you have a horse like Gunnett, who's just a big goofball and just gets in the stretch. He's on the wrong lead. He's not paying attention. He's not got his mind on business. So I think these are two horses that can be easily beat. So I definitely want to look to major fed in this race as well as a for surveillance. I'm with you. This is a spread race for me because I was going skinnier early on because if you told me that any horse won this race, I would not be surprised whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, my only thing with Hidden Scroll, now he's in the Wesley Ward barn. Does he go and show some speed? Do they try to go gate to wire? That's the only like small little concern with him. But I mean, we're never seeing that race that he ran at Gulfstream ever again. And I yes. think that everyone at least um, who is playing this game on a regular basis has realized that by now. And then with Gunnett, it's like, I feel as though he has more talent and more ability than Hidden Scroll and he's a faster horse, but you can't trust him either. So I'm with you with surveillance. I'm with you with major fed. Um, I also wanted to include heart rhythm, hear me song and ready to pounce as well, just for some extra coverage in here, because I don't trust anybody and anybody can win this race. And if you beat Gun it and hidden scroll, you're going to get paid a little bit more than you would if you just relied on those two very unreliable horses. Hear Me Song is another one that I've been a fan of for a while. I watched him at Turfway, um, put in some very, very good numbers. I think he's just as good on dirt as he is on the synthetic. I'm anxious to see him back on the synthetic. Ran a second and third behind Visitant and Sir Alfred James. Those horses actually put forward the two biggest buyer speed figures I believe that we had. At Turfway, as far in the um, the spring and the winter meets, so definitely really good back class for that horse. As, as I said, coming off of a win at Ellis Park, I think he's just as good on uh, the dirt as he is on the synthetic. So he would probably be the third one that I would be looking to include in this spot. That's cool to know. It's a little fun fact about mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the final race on the card. Race number eight. Uh, now you have ten thousand dollar claimers, the Phillies and mares, three year olds and up, non winners of two races, and there's no real standout in this field. I felt you could make a case for a lot of different horses, so this is another spread for me. I would use the two Ipsum Gratis, the seven Psychologist, the eight Super Tail of Houdini, and the nine Forgot password uh, just for some extra coverage in here because I have no super strong opinion. Um, I think that if I had to say one of them is my top pick, it would probably be super tail of Houdini. You're getting Renee Diaz, who, as we've already touched on, even though he is an apprentice, rides very smartly and had a really good spring meet at Churchill Downs. I'm looking forward to see what he does in the fall, if he can kind of continue that momentum going forwards. And I think this horse's race two back was the one that really stood out to me as being competitive with this field. Um, I think the psychologist is going to take a lot of intrigue from others since I've already seen a few talking about this horse as this one being their bet for opening night at Churchill Downs. So I don't know what kind of price we're going to get on this one, but wanted to include a couple just in case in here, although no major standout to me. Yeah, the ones that you mentioned are absolutely the ones I agree with. Super Taylor Houdini would probably be my number one as well. I definitely remember that performance um, a couple starts back at Churchill Downs. I think that was also a Downs After Dark Day, if I'm not mistaken. I really think it was. So um, I like the way Renee Diaz rode her, just didn't quite have enough 
in the tank, but I certainly think she fits in this group. Um, it's second start up off of a little bit of a layoff, uh, was on the turf last time out. Um, she got into a little bit of a speed duel, so I'm anxious to see what she can do getting back on the dirt and coming back um, when it comes across as well, second start up off the layoff. So she would probably be my top selection in this race, same as you're saying, but honestly, this could be the type of race, as it always usually is at Churchill, a kind of race that's a little bit lighter on class that is um, the last race on the card that I can see literally anybody winning. <laughs> uh, speaking of literally anybody winning before you go I have to ask you since we were able to see it together with the momentous upset of Rich Strike in the Kentucky Derby what were your thoughts on his Travers performance or lack thereof whichever way that you see it since this is a horse that you have more familiar with familiarity with having watched him train seen him go into the Derby things like that I think he kind of backed his performance up a little bit. I think it's obvious that he probably needs a little bit more of a pace than most horses do. I mean, clearly, you saw what he did in the Derby. But I think he's proving that he is one of the top-tier three-year-olds, and he's not to be dismissed. I think that this horse, because of maybe having connections that, aren't on, that are a little bit unknown, maybe kind of a little bit rough around the edges, also um, kind of reminds me a little bit of California Chrome's story. A horse that is maybe just getting a lot of disrespect because he's not from a flashy type of barn, doesn't have a flashy type of background. They're just like, oh, well, he was maybe just a one-hit wonder. Um, I think he's maybe proved that maybe he's not just a one-hit wonder. Will we ever see what he replicated in the Derby? I'm not sure if we ever will again. But, I mean, clearly he's going to be a graded stakes caliber winner. He's going to be a grade one place type of horse again, as we saw in the Travers. And I'm really, really, you know, looking forward to his start in the Lucas Classic, which they've said is coming up here at Churchill Downs. I think that is a very well-spotted race for this horse. I think even without pace, he's back at Churchill Downs. He's unbeaten at Churchill Downs. He loves that track. So I think that's going to be a really good place to maybe regroup with this horse off of a really good effort, the Travers versus sending him to the Pennsylvania Derby or somewhere out west something like that. I think this is a really good spot for this horse. It gives him a little bit of a chance to maybe go up against elders, but at a track that he really likes, we don't have a ton of horses probably coming for that race. Olympiad, maybe. I kind of doubt it though, but he does like Churchill. So I, I, I think it's fantastic. I think he's headed in the right direction. And if you think of, if they take him to the Breeders' Cup Classic, he's obviously going to get the distance. If both flight line and life is good go, there's going to be a hot pace. He could be a horse to think about to throw into your exotics in the classic, and he'll be every bit of 20 to 1, if not more. I mean, if he gets third in the classic and you have flight line and then somebody else that's a price and then rich strike in third, you're going to get paid. So I think that mm -hmm. that's a really good way to think about it. Um, I'm with you. I think the performance was just, it's better than expected. And I think yes. that's just the simplest way to put it. Um, maybe you expected more and you don't feel that way, or maybe you expected nothing at all and you had no expectations and it doesn't really matter. But I think he at least legitimized his credibility as a decent horse instead of just one fluke closing into a suicidal type of pace and it's never ever going to happen again because after the Belmont I think that we all kind of were writing him off as mm -hmm. all right well this derby really just was a, a function of race dynamics he got lucky that day it was a great ride every chip fell into place for him to have the success that he did to be that Kentucky Derby winner but I think that effort in the Travers at least did show us that he can hang with horses that are what we think of as the top three-year-olds um, right now in the country. Uh, I think that finishing that closely to horses like Cyberknife and Zandon really shows that, you know, he can go forward and have more success in his future. I, I also totally agree with you. You're saying about the, uh, the Lucas classic being a good spot for him to maybe face a little bit lesser in terms of competition, get back to the surface where he's most familiar and had his most, most success. So I'm just looking forward to seeing what we get from him in the future and not making a ton of assumptions about who he is or where they're going with him. Um, and it's just Cool to see that story continue to unfold um, as time goes on because it was probably one of the coolest racing moments that I've ever been a part of. In mm -hmm. Yeah, and I hope he's a horse that really they think of keeping um, in training. I'm sure he'll be in training at four. I really hope he's in training at five. I think he's the type of horse that can maybe get better with time, with age. We saw how he blossomed after getting a good foundation underneath of him. Um, I think he's the type of horse that doesn't like to be lightly raced either. I think he's a horse 
that needs some work. So coming off of a little bit um, of a break going to the Belmont, and I mean, there is such a fallacy where closers are automatically distance horses. I, we saw with him and we've seen with Zandon, that's not true. There needs to be a type of a hot pace. Maybe they can carry that over a route of ground, but it all comes down to how fast they're going up front. And I think we saw a little bit better picture of that in the Travers versus maybe what we saw from him in the Belmont. He was fresh in the Belmont. He's not a horse that I've ever thought of as being um, the type that really runs fresh. When I watched him at Turfway, little did I know how what he would turn into be. Um, I look back at a lot of my notes, and when I watch his three or four races there, he was the type that when um, his last race came at Turfway, I believe it was the Jeff Ruby Stakes, that was his best performance because he had a little bit more of that foundation, of that stamina underneath him. So I think he's the type of horse that's going to improve with age, and he's going to improve with extra performances. I'm with you there and appreciate all the inside information that you have because not a lot of people have that Turfway to Churchill Downs kind of experience and uh, get to follow these horses so closely. So really cool to hear your thoughts on him specifically and uh, looking forward to seeing you sometime soon at Churchill Downs. And thank you so much for taking the time to talk through opening day with me. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to see you in the next week or so. <laughs> Bye.